I want to start with that term, actually, the climate left, because in your piece, you are very clear that you count yourself among this group, right? Yeah, Although, as absolutely. you say, you have disagreements, and we're going to sort of pull some of those apart in a minute. Um, but just to, just to kick off, what is the climate left? Um, and, and maybe a related question is, we've been hearing a lot about eco-socialism in the last couple of years, I think. Um, I'm not actually sure how long the term has been around, but I, for my, for my own part, have been hearing it more and more. Um, so, so what is kind of this new climate movement, I guess? I mean, I suppose the climate left would be those people um, who are concerned about climate change um and associated uh, by crises like biodiversity loss uh, nitrogen pollution so you name it um but that um also have a, a critique of capitalism to some extent mm -hmm. uh whether that is sort of like liberal left through to social demo democratic or further afield to a sort of more a, a democratic socialism or even uh, or anarchism, that, that sort of category of people, as opposed to simply the sort of centrists or conservatives who might be concerned about climate change. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's pretty yes. expensive. It's, yeah. Right, yeah. I mean, so that uh, that element of kind of the critique of capitalism um, is what I want to sort of zero in on, right? Because at least, you know, in, in my kind of understanding, um, uh, much of the climate left is very explicitly pro-labor or pro-working class. So some examples are, you know, the Sunrise Movement has very openly and vocally supported the PRO Act. Um, even the Green New Deal, you know, is at its heart a public jobs and infrastructure program, which was ostensibly written with the interests of working people in mind. Um, and uh, as you just said, you know, lots of activists who are part of the climate left have sort of identified capitalism as the root cause of environmental destruction. So there does seem to be in some ways, um, at least to my understanding, a move away from some of the like, like lifestyle environmentalism of, you know, the 90s where, you know, you were told to like turn off lights and, you know, buy green and so forth. And now there does seem to be a, a foregrounded critique of capitalism. But what I wanted to get into with you is, um, so the climate left is, you know, pro-labor, right? But at the same time, as your piece points out, there are still so many instances in which the climate left seems to run up against a large segment of the labor movement itself, namely the building trades. So the question, I guess, is what's going on here? Well, I mean, fundamentally, I think the the issue here is that uh, despite the expressions of uh, solidarity for uh, for labor, for for work, for the working class and working class communities, uh, by many people on the climate left, um, it is a projection of uh, sort of. I, uh, let me put it another way: it's for the climate left. Uh, sorry, it's for uh, it's for labor. It's for mm -hmm. the working class, uh, or it's intended that way. But it's not by the working class. It's not mm -hmm. of the working class. That it, so. Um, I mean, one of the the, the sort of the, the things that we can see in this is that, and I refer to this in, in, in my article, is that, you know, in 2019, there were a series of protests by building trades unions um, in California against uh, an L.A., ver no, Los Angeles version of uh, the Green New Deal. And then later on during the, uh, the Democratic Convention there, uh, there was a large protest that they, by, again, by building trades unions. Um, uh, that they called a sort of blue collar revolution to mm. that was against the Green New Deal. Uh, Richard Trump, the late um, uh, former president of the of the AFL CIO, uh, the largest uh, trade union central in in the United States, um, you know, he he was quite critical of the the, uh, the Green New Deal as as written or as proposed, uh, saying that you know they're at, at, uh, labor is the house of labor is absolutely in favor of something along these lines even a green new deal but as it has been proposed um labor will not put up with the loss of jobs or tax on um, working class communities um and you know it's not just in um uh in the united states in france the cgt the uh, uh the the um, the main sort of left wing trade union there that's historically associated with the Communist Party has been very critical of, of the left's opposition to nuclear power mm -hmm. and the clean transition. Same, same with the GMB, one of the largest trade unions in the UK. The Australian Workers Union has taken a similar position, critical of the climate left for, for its opposition to nuclear power. Um, and uh, even, you know, Sarah Nelson, the, uh, the, the great militant head of the Association of Flight Attendants, 
Um, while she supports a Green New Deal and her organization has actually even formally endorsed a Green New Deal, she's also actually very critical of suggestions by those on the green left that we need to get rid of avi aviation mm -hmm. or even or just simply reduce aviation and instead is supported and in fact you know there's one interview with her where she actually laughed at the very idea <laughs> that there will be some sort of reduction in in aviation and that what we need instead is some sort of industrial policy i.e economic planning along the lines of what i was talking about in in my book with me how rose forsky of people's republic of walmart mm -hmm. to shepherd um the uh, the development of uh, synthetic clean fuels that are alternatives to uh to the fossil fuels that are used for for, for jet fuel um so there's um yeah so there's 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 a lot of um sort of disagreement and um, very public disagreement between uh the climate left um and the house of labor mm -hmm. um unfortunately the way that this has been sort of described in the media i mean there's been a lot of articles about this mainly in 2019 but you know every now and then you see similar sort of things pop up um and uh, the way that the media has largely described this uh, is as a sort of like a battle between, you know, blue collar, uh, hard hats, right. uh, uh, hippie punching, <laughs> the feet coastal elites. And that's not really what's going on here. Um, and I can talk about a little bit more about that in a second, but I'm sure I've talked too much already. No, no. I, I mean, that, you know, that actually leads very well into what I wanted to kind of get into next, which is the stakes of this kind of divide, right? So um, I actually want to pull up a series of tweets that uh, I, I think are interesting because they come from a progressive NGO staffer who has worked both in the labor movement and in the climate movement. Um, so this staffer wrote, New York climate left people often chase a mirage, real labor union support. I say this as an extremely pro-union person who spent a decade at a mid to high level working for a strong progressive union, CWA, in New York. It's not going to happen. Don't chase a mirage. The issue is that Labor's house is burning down. It's an extraordinarily difficult challenge to stay alive when a powerful quicksand is steadily sucking you down. In that context, no union is going to devote any truly substantial measure of its power to advance climate action. Rather than try and win over labor, the, ma the major challenge is preventing some unions from attacking and undermining climate action in tandem with their employers. If you want to think this through, I can't recommend enough talking to people who work for or recently worked for a union. Um, and the reason why I wanted to kind of bring up this sentiment is because uh, this person seems to be making a strategic argument, right? Like they're saying that labor is in decline, kind of on the back foot. And I don't think either of us would disagree with that. Um, but does it then follow that the climate movement does not need unions? Well, no. I mean, one, first of all, uh, the labor movement is, I mean, the reason why the socialists and social democrats put such an emphasis on the importance of, of trade unions and working people is not because there's any sort of like special sort of uh, pity or they're particularly more oppressed than other people or anything like right. that. It's their role in society that is mm -hmm. really essential. That no other group of people in society has the ability to withdraw their labor, uh, to go on strike, uh, to uh, to uh, to halt production, to actually threaten the profits of of elites. So, it is much 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 more powerful as a weapon um, to uh, to transform society, to change things in society than any set of protests, any set of leafleting, um, any 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 blockades, any any sort of action that activists do on their own. Um, as powerful as that can be, sometimes. Um, it, it pales in comparison to the uh, to the power of labor uh, to withdraw their labor. So if we want something to happen, we absolutely have to make sure that labor is on board. But I, there's a sort of problem with that tweet there that the the author of it uh, is basically pres uh, assuming that um, that labor's critique of the Green New Deal or labor's positions on climate change isn't progressive or mm -hmm. isn't uh, supportive of deep decarbonization. This is actually incorrect. Um, if you look at the, uh, if you move beyond the sort of uh, media narrative about the conflict between the climate left and, and the House of Labor, uh, you find that all of these organizations uh, there is a, there are putting forward proposals that are where they're saying we, we are open to a Green New Deal or um, sort of economic planning or industrial policy built out of, of, of infrastructure. Uh, mm -hmm. But there are a series of different demands that labor has. Um, mm -hmm. Three main things. One is they absolute that the climate left absolutely has to begin dropping its opposition to a range of technologies that really are necessary for uh, for the clean transition, including nuclear uh, power, uh, which is clean and available 24/7, uh, carbon capture and storage, 
Um, and even sort of the idea that we need to shut off all um, fossil fuel combustion right now, society mm -hmm. would fall apart if we did that. So we have to plan it very, very carefully, ensuring that there's a just transition for the communities involved. Mm -hmm. um, that the second, that um, the climate left activists have to speak to trade unions and working class people before they come up with these plans, not yeah. after, and then tell them about it. And this is mm -hmm. you know, one of Trump, uh, Richard Trumpka's main critiques was, this wasn't, nobody ever really talked to us about this before uh, right. the, the plants were developed. And, um, and, and finally, that they really, really want a, a firm commitment from the climate left to be, uh, to fighting, be fighting alongside unions and working yeah. people, um, especially energy sector uh, uh, workers, uh, to defend and enhance uh, their wages, their conditions, their pensions and benefits. And they just really haven't been there with respect to some of the big fights that sort of the United Mine Workers is, uh, have been um, fighting over pensions in the last uh, few years. Mm -hmm. And also, they just absolutely have not not merely uh, not supported um, worker energy sector workers who work at nuclear power plants to defend those uh, really essential parts of, of a clean grid. Um, they've actually been participating with NG green NGOs to fight for the shuttering of those those plants. So it's not it's really isn't the case that um, you've got these uh, trade un trade unions over here who are like maybe a little bit more conservative and we've got to win them to a more progressive position. Right. No, no, no. They're much more progressive than the um, climate change than the climate left is. Yeah, I mean, that was, at least for me, a really interesting and useful part of your article that you, you know, point out that uh, seemingly unbeknownst to many environmental activists, unions, as you just said, have actually been trying to produce and advance their own climate solutions, like for decades, basically. Um, so can you say a little bit more about what some of those solutions look like? You alluded to it a little bit. Um, but then maybe also, like, why, why hasn't anybody been listening? <laughs> I mean, I think uh, fundamentally there are some real, why this is happening is that there are some real um, parallels between the questions around um, uh, climate change, biodiversity loss, um, and uh, the sort of the progressive left's positions on these, and the progressive left's positions with respect to identity politics. That is to say that there's a... Um, uh, the left is no longer, at the, at the moment, very representative of the class as a whole. It's not to say that um, the left isn't made up of workers. It is, but very particular kinds of workers. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the term professional managerial class is ba bandied around, and I, you know, I get some of the critiques of that because it isn't, it's not very well theorized. But that sort of idea that um, the, um, the, the left at the moment in the United States and Britain and Canada and Western Europe is very, very sort of more... Um, uh, there's a lot of grad students and academics and uh, journalists like myself, and there's nothing wrong with any of these people, but we just don't, the left just doesn't look like what the, the entirety of the, uh, the working class looks like. And so that means that, um, uh, that the whole series of uh, sort of solutions for, for climate change are just really going to be thought about. Whereas mm -hmm. these, um, uh, the building trades unions, they mm -hmm. work uh, day in, day out, building things, um, mm -hmm. um, uh, putting, uh, uh, developing um, HVAC systems. Um, and the energy sector workers know about how the, the grid works better than anybody does, even the, 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 the sort of energy systems modelers in academia. I mean, there's, uh, there's this incredible wealth of uh, formal, and, both formal and tacit knowledge about energy systems, industrial uh, uh, systems, uh, transport systems, uh, agriculture that lives in the in the minds and bodies of 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 of, of these of these workers, of industrial workers. And if we don't have those people in our movement, or we don't have many of them in our movement, then um, the the sort of uh, so the sets of solutions that uh, NGOs and academics come up with and activists and journalists um, may not be very viable. Um, mm -hmm. So a great example of this would be, you know, this, this, the, the, uh, the situation with, where we have um, activist groups like uh, Plain Stupid or Stay Grounded and, mm -hmm. and uh, who are campaigning against aviation or um, the building of, um, uh, of new airports or trying to get people to fly less or just not fly at all. Um, right. Extinction Rebellion has had protests outside Heathrow Airport in the UK. Um, Greta Thunberg, rather than flying um, to, uh, uh, to the United States for, for a climate protest, she um, uh, got in a, a, a yacht 
uh, racing yacht owned by right, the, right. Uh, the Monaco royal family in order to apparently avoid the uh, the climate the, the carbon emissions of, of flying there. Now, um, but if you speak to somebody like Sarah Nelson, um, uh, she's going to be saying things like, well, why are you throwing under the bus the, uh, the flight attendants, the uh, mm -hmm. air traffic control workers, the ground staff, the pilots, all of which depend on this, uh, this, uh, this, this means of transport. And the, um, you're turning them into, into an enemy uh, with respect to climate change instead of an ally that is probably the most important ally you can have in the fight to make the, uh, the large airlines pay uh, for um, uh, the clean transition to pay for um, um, industrial, uh, the, the development of, of, of clean fuels um, mm -hmm. and to support policies like in, industrial policy that will take uh, clean fuels from sort of lab bench through to commercialization. I, I, I want to focus on the transition part now, the so-called just transition, right? Um, because you had mentioned earlier that uh, you know, part of the reason why there is sometimes this friction or tension between, uh, you know, the labor movement and the climate left uh, is because green jobs are presently not very good jobs. So, yeah. so can you talk a little bit about why green jobs are not good jobs right now? And then maybe as a follow up, like, how can they be made good? Well, it depends what we're talking about. <clears throat> One of the things that the, <laughs> sorry, one of the things that uh, labor is very concerned about is that um, a number of the jobs with respect to uh, variable renewables, um, particularly solar and onshore wind, are very uh, transient. They're very low paid. They're unskilled. You're slapping mm -hmm. solar panels on roofs or racks. Um, uh, there are, you know, there's, there's no parking lot outside a um, uh, a, uh, a solar farm the way that there is outside a coal plant or a nuclear power plant. <clears throat> and all of this means that it's very, very hard for uh, unions to organize. Uh, unions uh, can organize and they should be organizing, but we also have to understand that a union isn't a magic wand either mm -hmm. that can turn a $16 an hour unskilled job into a $100,000 a year family supporting income. Right. Um, and but there are lots of parts of the clean transition, like nuclear power, offshore wind, which is more uh, reliable, um, um, uh, carbon capture and storage. You know, if you're a pipe fitter, it doesn't really matter whether you're um, uh, building out a pipeline for natural gas or, or petroleum, or you're building out a pipeline for uh, clean, carbon neutral, synthetic uh, natural gas or synthetic um uh, jet fuel or synthetic um, uh, petroleum, which may be necessary for a number of different sectors that are really, really hard to electrify. Avia long haul aviation is basically you can't you can't stick a battery uh, on a on a, on a uh, long haul flight uh, because it's simply too heavy. The plane can't get off the ground. Similarly, with long haul uh, shipping, um, it's, it's small ferries you can electrify, but going right across the Pacific Ocean, you know, there's no recharging stations in the middle of the, uh, the Pacific. Um, and so for, for these reasons, we probably will continue to need some sort of fuels. So we have to make sure that they're clean fuels. And all of the jobs that create that support those sorts of things, if we have a much greater proportion um, of, of nuclear power, if we have a greater proportion of reliable uh, clean electricity, if we, um, if we are using some of these technologies, like carbon capture and storage, negative emissions technologies, um, and even fracking for hydraulic fracturing for advanced geothermal, uh, these are it's much easier for for uh, for workers in those sector in the fossil sector to see themselves in the, uh, uh, having good jobs in, the, in a in a de completely decarbonized economy. Their communities are preserved. Uh, we can swap out, um, 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 uh, you know. Uh, boilers and, and coal plants and, and put in uh, nu advanced nuclear power, uh, nuclear reactors. Mm -hmm. um, and those communities are protected. Uh, those jobs are protected. They're, uh, they're highly skilled, which means they're going to be highly paid. They're much more easily to unionize. Um, so that's so and it all, it's not just about um, uh, labor. It is also this will do a better job, a faster job of decarbonizing the economy than a dependence only upon or primarily upon variable renewables like wind and solar uh, that uh, can only produce electricity when the wind is blowing or the sun is shining. 
So I think you've made a pretty compelling case uh, that, you know, the tension that kind of arises between climate movements and labor movements isn't just a function of like the fact that unions are somehow like conservative or reactionary or they're just like digging their heels in. I think that you have made a, a very strong case for that. But I'm wondering if you if you think that there's any um, there's any instance in which the climate left could or should try to steer unions in a different direction? Or is it just is it just that the left should always be following the lead of the unions? So <clears throat> certainly the argument that I'm making uh, critiquing the idea from the climate left that the reason why labor is taking these positions or is more critical, has been more critical of the Green New Deal, um, is a result of business unionism or conservative unionism uh, mm -hmm. is incorrect. I'm like, I think that's yeah. wrong. Yeah. It's not at the same time. At the same time, I'm not absolutely not saying that um, uh, the trade union positions are practically perfect in every way, like Mary Poppins. Right. Um, I, the, the, the one should never critique them. Um, but just that um, we need to be a lot more we need to realize that the bulk of the critiques that the house of labor has had of the climate left are actually completely legitimate mm -hmm. yeah I, I would say sorry I, one thing i should add is that there's lots of examples where things are working um i would say where um so, uh, uh, trade unionists and and cl uh, pro-nuclear climate activists were very successful in uh, defending um, uh, nuclear power in Illinois and developing um, uh, climate policies there that that labor absolutely has embraced. Uh, Maine has done a great uh, activist in Maine actually went to uh, to labor first before developing their uh, their green New, their state level uh, green New Deal policy, which has actually been passed. One of the things that uh, was developed there was as a result of this, there's much greater emphasis on the need for apprenticeships. Um, mm -hmm. And which, um, you know, uh, sort of, uh, sort of more middle class uh, climate activists. And that's not necessarily something there that's going to be front of mind. So just right. again, there's this enormous body of knowledge that exists within uh, within the working class, and let's let's take advantage of that where it's mm -hmm. happening. Um, we're getting we're seeing green new deals pass. We're seeing uh, labor getting mm. on board with this stuff. Um, in Hawaii, there's a really really interesting and innovative. Um, uh, effort there on the part of a number of um, uh, hospitality workers who've been very engaged in uh, some really bitter strikes and struggles over um, uh, labor conditions in, in the hospitality sector and are you know, in un uh, the Union Unite here. And, you know, they're they're working with uh, with climate scientists and engineers at uh, the, um, uh, the University of Hawaii to develop to try to develop a workers cooperative uh, factory that produces exactly the clean um, uh, jet fuel that I was talking about a few minutes ago mm -hmm. and are looking for uh, for government support for that. Uh, that's really, really exciting. I think that's really interesting. It also speaks to, I mean, I should have mentioned this earlier, it was, you know, if the, the proposal from the climate left is that there's not going to be any avi any aviation anymore, any flights anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens to the entire economy of, of Hawaii? What about right. Guam? What about Puerto Rico? Um, you're just writing uh, the, these 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 parts of the United States off that happen to be on islands um, and you know very racialized communities, uh, it, uh, um, you know deep histories of colonialism, and mm -hmm. so that just ignoring of of those communities. To my mind, I mean that just sounds like sort of neo-colonialism to me, but really at the end of the day, what it is is that um, the climate left just isn't representative enough of the entirety of the working class. If we were much more uh, representative of the entirety, breadth and diversity of the working class, um, these ideas like ban, ban flying just would never come up. Right. Uh, you know, I, I think on that note, um, this will be my last question for you. And I want to circle back to kind of what we kicked off with uh, when, when I asked you about sort of eco-socialism and uh, the rise of, you know, this new climate left. Because something that I was trying to get at is, uh, as I said before, um, I do feel like the kind of uh, framework of eco-socialism or like even a Green New Deal is in many ways a departure from the more like lifestyle centered environmentalism of days of old. Uh, you know, I, I think that we hear more, at least on the climate left, about uh, fighting capitalism than we do like, you know, don't use straws or whatever. Um, but that said, you have been bringing up these other examples of, you know, people who want to like ban aviation or want to ground all mm -hmm. planes or even reduce aviation. So I'm wondering, um, to what extent have we really moved past this kind of like lifestyle politics or like 
consumer focused politics. Um, how much of that do you think is still pervading, pervading or like, I don't know, like infecting, I guess, the Green New Deal framework? And then maybe a follow up to that is, does it really matter all that much? Or do we need some sort of is it is it a bad thing to have kind of uh, eye to lifestyle changes as well as, you know, obviously fighting uh, the sort of larger problem of capitalism? I mean, I mean, if people want to um, on their own um, um, do some some actions to, uh, you know, um, to limit their climate impact, I mean, I, sure, fill your boots. But it, right. unfortunately, a lot of these uh, lifestyle uh, these calls, these you know, banning of of uh, of straws um, or you know, buying local food, mm -hmm. um, eating organic. I mean, actually, these things are either have very little to no impact with respect to uh, emissions reduction, um, or in some cases are actually counterproductive. So local uh, food production is much more land extensive than the single biggest source of emissions within uh, from from ag from agriculture is land use change. So um, uh, if everybody sh everybody in the world shifted to local organic uh, agriculture, it would be much we'd use a lot lot more land to produce the same amount of food, um, which would increase emissions. It wouldn't reduce it. Uh, so um, and to some extent, some of these individual choices are they're okay, they're fine. Other ones, they're just they're they're bananas. They actually don't work. And they're they're the counterproductive. So it's very good that we have we're beginning to see a shift towards a more a more of a critique, a systemic or a structural critique. <clears throat> At the same time, the fundamental problem that we face with capitalism with respect to climate change, biodiversity loss, whatever sort of environmental issue we're talking about, is not um, um, economic growth um, uh, or industry or modernity. The mm -hmm. problem that we face with respect to climate change uh, and these other issues with respect to uh, with uh, uh, capitalism is that markets, uh, uh, actors within markets, continue to have an incentive to keep producing things um, uh, that are profitable, even if even once we've discovered that they're harmful. Uh, so, like fossil fuels, for example, um, and there is no incentive within markets uh, for the production of say, new infrastructure uh, that we know that we do need that will be beneficial, but isn't profitable or isn't sufficiently profitable or it's too, um, or it's too risky uh, for, for, capitalist, for, for investors to, to invest in. So um, the uh, eco-socialism, unfortunately, I mean, I, I have some problems with the, even with the term because I think socialism is just already, that's fine. We, we, we don't need to add the eco, it's already, <laughs> that all the solutions that we 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 need are already enveloped within socialism um uh adding an eco to it suggests that there's something outside of socialism that we need to do mm. but that's 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 not correct um and um oh where was i going with this oh i i mean basically it's a question of economic planning it's not a question yep. we need to be focusing on industrial policy technology policy um build out of infrastructure uh, that's the sort of thing that we need not these eco-socialist critiques of economic growth. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Lee, thank you very much. I want to shout out your piece again. It's Blue Collars, Green Jobs. That appears in the Breakthrough Journal. It's a great piece, so I encourage everybody to check that out. Uh, Lee, thank you again. It was good to see you. Thanks, Jen. Yeah, good talking to you. If you like this video from The Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks.